Hey, this is Mark Pugh, and welcome to the upload. And I'm really, really pleased to have Ed Moriarty on the phone with me today. Ed has become a great friend of mine over the past several years. Honestly, I can't remember exactly how we got connected, but um, we've spoken on a panel together, um, actually visited his house in Salem, Massachusetts, and he gave me a tour of the city. Um, just a great, great guy. And I'm really excited, Ed, for you to be able to share your personal story. Um, Ed, welcome. And uh, uh, if you can give the audience kind of an introduction to who you are um, and where you're coming, and then we'll flow right on into the conversation. Thanks very much, Mark. Really happy to be with you. Um, I am a workers' comp insurance defense attorney here in uh, Salem, Massachusetts. I've been representing the interests of the insurers and self insurers here in Massachusetts in litigation matters for 40 years. The uh, emphasis on my uh, practice has been, and maybe that's how Mark and I uh, cross paths, uh, the emphasis on my practice uh, has been the intersection really between medicine and workers' compensation, trying to get employees the best medical care, but also medical care that is keyed, hopefully, toward returning them to gainful employment, if not to their regular and usual job, uh, a job that has accommodations that are consistent with their restrictions. And incident to that, I uh, did, of course, come in contact with Mark, as you did in your business, with the unfortunate intersection not only of drugs and workers' compensation, but opioids and what we could characterize, I think, as the misuse of prescription opioids in the treatment of chronic pain in the injured worker. And uh, that's my uh, background to the uh, topic that has uh, become uh, uh, both uh, painful and uh, also promising to me uh, on a go-forward basis. Uh, you, you've been passionate about opioid issue um, and the appropriate treatment for pain. Um, and I remember when we were on a panel together at the SIIA conference in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and um, we had an opportunity, I think it was a meal, I can't remember if it was dinner, breakfast, something like that, but it was on kind of the veranda that was overlooking, you know, the beautiful mountains of Asheville. And you shared your personal story and, and why you were so passionate about opioids. Um, and I know you haven't necessarily talked about it publicly in general. I know you've shared it with some people, but, you know, I really appreciate your willingness to kind of open up and talk about your journey um, and how the issue of opioids affected you and specifically your son. So um, if you can kind of start off with, you know, how that journey evolved um, and uh, we'll just continue the conversation and hopefully help people kind of understand that there is nobody immune uh, to the opioid epidemic. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, that, that's true, true for sure. And that's something that I have uh, found out uh, both uh, personally and uh, painfully. Um, if you go back in time, uh, actually approximately about uh, five years, uh, that is when uh, I found out and also other members of my family here in Salem found out that my son, who was living in New York City at the time, uh, was hooked on heroin. And uh, that's uh, painful for, of course, er every parent, every sister, uh, every member of the family. But what is a little bit ironic uh, and kind of indicates that nobody is uh, uh, immune, as you say, Mark, from the uh, horrors of opioid addiction, is the number of people actually in my son's family who uh, you would think would be able to spot something like this or suspect something. And actually, there's my dogs. Actually, you, hey. <laughs> you have no uh, uh, idea sometimes until it actually uh, collides uh, with you. For, for example, I was quite knowledgeable about opioids and the contraindication for opioid prescriptions. Uh, my wife actually, uh, she's the executive director here in Salem with the local uh, Boys and Girls Club, but she had about 15 or 20 years experience in public health, had a master's in public health. Uh, I have another daughter who is a mental health counselor with a lot of expertise in uh, uh, counseling people with substance use disorder. I have another daughter who's a district attorney and actually prosecutes um, uh, opioid uh, uh, and uh, drug runners. And nobody in our family uh, had uh, the slightest inkling that my son Evan uh, had a drug problem, let alone that he was actually hooked uh, on heroin. Uh, it was uh, kind of dramatic because my uh, 
<clears throat> daughter was actually working at a local emergency room and a friend of my son's uh, who uh, was an inpatient at an emergency room situation where he also had a drug and alcohol problem indicated to my daughter that uh, my son was uh, actively using uh, heroin in uh, New York City in, in Brooklyn. So uh, she had to break the news to us <clears throat> and that's how we started our journey uh, to uh, find out how hooked the uh, uh, the child was on the drug, how it had uh, robbed him really of his uh, humanity and uh, was uh, life threatening. And you, you can imagine with a family with this background, uh, it was of course devastating, but also somewhat surprising. Gee, you, you didn't have any inkling, you didn't have any idea. And, and you, it, it causes you to think back that you might have seen signs or symptoms or suggestions, uh, but it just hit us uh, like a ton of bricks. Hmm. Yeah, it is. It, it, it is kind of weird. I, I with all of those people in your family that are kind of geared towards understanding and recognizing those particular issues. I'm sure you played the what if game um, in regards to that. H how does that play out in a family when you're going through? Well, didn't you see that? Well, didn't you see that? Well, now I remember when he did. Did you go back and, and try to kind of piece the puzzles together and figure out that there was a point in time where you could have or should have seen it? Or Yes, I, I, I think so. Uh, as we know, there's kind of a small little a group of signs or symptoms of, of people that are, that are hooked on uh, heroin. And, and one of the things that you notice in a heroin user is that they are subject to these... Uh, uh, very quick moments of where they literally will uh, nod out and then wake up again. And that's at a moment where they are, or at least they think they're experiencing that type of connection that they uh, want from the drug to, to get their high. So <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, my son had been living with us when he was going to school here in Salem and commuting into Boston for a while. And uh, we thought about that. And I think that when it occurred, you just tend to think that, oh, he, he's tired. Uh, he's been studying late. Uh, he's been doing a lot of hard work at school. Uh, so that was probably the biggest tell that should have been a hint, especially to his mother and I, that uh, there's th this is obvious drug behavior, very significant heroin addiction drug behavior where there's this nodding out constantly even in the middle of a, a conversation and uh, we just ignored it or uh, didn't think much about it and I think that was the biggest opportunity we had to intervene sooner probably months sooner than we ultimately did. So how did your son originally get connected to heroin because that that's not typically something it's not typically something that you dive right into the deep end usually there's there's a shallow end of the pool that you get in. How, do you, tracing back, did you figure out how he got into heroin? That's a that's a you know that's a good question. I think it's probably different for every uh, heroin user. Uh, but what we have seen uh, nationwide is, uh, of course, it knows no uh, boundaries, and uh, it can uh, afflict the uh, middle aged. It can afflict the young. It can afflict the very young, uh, black, white, male, female. Uh, but there is a uh, core of uh, users that studies have found are sort of like my son, could be uh, white males in their uh, 20s uh, to 30s who somehow find that that becomes uh, part of their lifestyle. So my uh, son had uh, graduated uh, from college, uh, actually uh, did quite well in school, graduated from the University of Chicago and uh, moved to New York City. And uh, if you go back about five years, I think that uh, heroin, uh, including black tar heroin, was very popular in Brooklyn, which is, as we know, parts of Brooklyn are kind of a hip section of New York City. And that's where he was uh, living at the time. And uh, I, I think that he had a, a weakness in terms of uh, probably a genetic predisposition toward addiction. If you look at my family history, for example, in terms of alcohol, so I, I think that he always had a problem uh, maintaining uh, a balance between appropriate and inappropriate use of alcohol. But I think he got introduced in Brooklyn to uh, heroin, especially black tar, as being uh, something cool and uh, something that can augment 
a high that you can get from uh, alcohol and also it was at the time quite cheap and i think it's probably still rather rather cheap and uh found that uh, he liked it and uh, started using it more and more and more until uh, that became the really the driver of his uh, behavior and uh, his existence so how has this evolved over time you've talked about kind of in retrospect five years ago um recovery the conversations that you and he have had that that he and your entire family have had um kind of walk through that process of identifying my son as a heroin addict and, and moving forward how did how does that how did that work within the dynamics of your family it, it, of course it's a um very slow and a painful process and the uh, toughest thing about uh, discovering uh, that your child is an addict uh, is uh, once you've learned that horrible fact mark the question becomes what, what can you do to help and uh, what what does help look like and uh, what might be effective and for whatever reason uh, we, we believe that uh, you can call it God's will or you can call it fate, but it seemed as though we were able to have an intervention uh, in his drug use just at the right time uh, because uh, subsequently Evan uh, indicated that he never was an intravenous drug user uh, of heroin. He, he always used the uh, Mexican black tar, which is uh, inhaled by the user to get the high. And there's some evidence that suggests that once you're an IV heroin drug user, it's even tougher to quit and stay quit, so to speak. So he acknowledges that he was sort of right on the edge of needing an IV high from a heroin because he wasn't getting that magic high that we all know uh, addicts chase and uh, actually never achieve because uh, uh, there's no high that's equivalent to the first high. So I think Evan was lucky that he did not go to intravenous drug use when his family and en masse went to Brooklyn and, and uh, basically uh, sat in his house in Brooklyn and uh, said that he was going to come home to uh, get help. And uh, you, you can't force somebody to uh, get, get help. But uh, my wife's position was, you also can't force me to leave your, <laughs> you also can't force me to leave your house. So if you don't want to get help, uh, I'm just going to be living here uh, and ride it out, ride it out with you. So somehow he had uh, enough uh, foresight or or knowledge uh, that there was a need for help at at some level, even if he was still addicted, had never even sought help before when his family en masse came down to his Brooklyn apartment and uh, had a classic intervention slash confrontation, he was able to accept help. And that's what started the journey. And then you follow what's necessarily the, the classic response to any addiction. And the first step was detoxification. And uh, then from there, uh, Evan uh, took a slightly a different turn and and uh, kind of went for a, a counseling uh, uh, AA model uh, to uh, obtain and then maintain sobriety and and uh, it has been successful for him. There's so many st stories of people having setbacks uh, and it's uh, so common that uh, people uh, fall off the wagon that that's part of the recovery, the uh, falling off of the wagon and having to get back on. But he has been lucky or blessed. And so have we, that uh, he is going to be five years sober, 25 June. And he's uh, actually never had uh, an opportunity to uh, have to climb up again and get back on the wagon. It's been uh, a, a constant uh, set of circumstances, if one day at a time, to uh, maintain his uh, sobriety since uh, 25 June, five years ago. That's awesome. And it, it's uh, not surprising that that date is imprinted in your mind um, in regards to when that sobriety happened. Um, certainly, you know, people in recovery, uh, you know, it, it is a moment by moment choice um, to, to stay uh, on the recovery path. Have you had that discussion about how to encourage him? You know, I, I can't even imagine as a parent myself having to come to an agreement that all of us on Moss are going to go and have a, a, maybe even a physical confrontation 
with our son to say, this is not good. That, that thought process has got to be very difficult. But now that you're past that and he's on the, he's in recovery, how is that communication? Has it opened up relationship? Has it opened up further um, communication? Has it deepened relationships? How, how does that work when everybody's at his house going, you need to do something different? He chooses to do that. Now he's on there and he's got, you know, all these cheerleaders on his side. It, it really is a, a, a remarkable uh, a process, Mark. We're, we're uh, again, uh, just one day at a time. We really are very blessed that uh, it has worked out so well uh, for Evan. Um, uh, my wife, and I, I, I wish I could remember the name of it, but my wife kind of stumbled across a uh, a Japanese uh, form of uh, art, and it also is a little bit of a Japanese philosophy of life. I just can't remember the name if she were available. But the, the, the concept is that um, a piece of art uh, over time may become uh, fragmented or crack. And what the Japanese artists do in this type of work is actually fill in the cracks with gold so that the cracks in the art are as important as the overall vase, so to speak. And what, what, what we have found is that Evan has been able to recognize his weaknesses, acknowledge his susceptibility toward uh, addiction, and not rise above it, but become a slightly different person. You are the same person, but you have these proclivities or you have these sensitivities or you have these weaknesses, but you become aware of them. You are humbled by them. You acknowledge that you need help, but by consistently following from Evan's perspective, if you consistently follow an AA model, you can become actually a better person by showing your weaknesses or your susceptibilities or your past drug use to a society and sharing with people on a constant basis where you have been. Where you have been allows you to be in a better place in the present and also to aspire to uh, uh, your hopes or your dreams or your aspirations for the future. So what we have found is that Actually, my son is uh, a very different person now. Uh, after kind of going through this uh, furnace uh, of uh, pain and suffering and loss, and, and actually is is uh, more humble, is more grateful, is more honest, and is more sharing than really he ever was before. And, and to his uh, mom and dad and, and his sisters, uh, is uh, almost uh, unrecognizable compared to what he was uh, at, at any point in time. Kind of a selfish, self-centered uh, college student and, and immediately post-college, post uh, uh, all about himself and uh, also all about getting the getting the next high and now you couldn't find you couldn't find a, a a person who's more concerned about the other person what can i do to help you because by helping you i'm helping myself it's it's really quite a remarkable uh, metamorphosis and uh, he's really a, a valued member of our family now and and you will find everybody in the family actually asking his opinion uh, about things because he'll have a very careful and, and a thoughtful response to whatever the issue of the day might be. And he was so transformed by his experience that he uh, just last month graduated from NYU with a master's degree in uh, social work. And he's interested in uh, uh, working uh, with uh, mental health issues uh, and uh, therapy. The, the, the struggle out of the cocoon to the butterfly is difficult, but um, the butterfly doesn't become the butterfly without that effort. Um, and it sounds, you, you use the term metamorphosis, chances are really good he never would have gotten that degree, never would have had that uh, approach to life. Um, you know, the 12th step in the 12-step program is paying it forward, essentially. Um, and it certainly sounds like that's what he's doing. He's leveraging that experience. 
um, you know, how has it changed? So it, he has changed dramatically and, and for the better. He, as you kind of described, he's a, a better person um, now. Uh, and he's going to have a tremendous impact, I, I think, on a lot of different people because of his walk and his ability to help. How has it changed your family in going through the recognition that he's an addict to the playing the what if game of could we have stopped this before to the uh, you know, the conversation of we need to literally go down to New York and have an intervention with him um, to being successful in that, bringing him back home, helping him through the detoxification process, finding the support that he needed, continue to support. Y'all been on a journey as well, um, you know, individually, collectively. So what what has that done for your family from the beginning of, oh, my gosh, what happened to the now, you know, the hugs, hugs all the way around? It's been challenging for you know really every every uh, member of our family. Mark, it's just it's a small family. Uh, my my uh, son is the youngest, and then I have two uh, older daughters. So uh, my son is now thirty, and my daughters are thirty four and thirty six. So it was interesting because this certainly challenges the family structure. Um, Parents can't help but focus with laser-like precision and attention. Every waking moment, what am I going to do to help my son? How can I help my son? And inevitably, there's only so much time in the day. And there's only so much care and attention and love, really, that you can provide. So I think that initially... Uh, my son Evan certainly needed all of the care and attention that his parents could provide. So inevitably, I, you pay less attention to your other children. Uh, uh, maybe you uh, take for granted a little bit how sober they are, how sensitive they are, how caring they are. And we were lucky uh, because I still devote a lot of my time to uh, helping families that are afflicted with children of uh, uh, addiction and opioids. But we, we were lucky there wasn't a fracture within the family. O oftentimes, uh, other siblings aren't as understanding or supportive. Uh, they miss the attention. They miss the support. They miss the time that might be uh, shared with uh, them that are, is being spent with the, the addict child. So we, we were just lucky. We, we found and and fairly early on in the process, I think had enough insight to realize, wow, his sisters are incredibly supportive, even though it means less time and attention for them. For example, my oldest daughter, right around the time that my son became sober, uh, delivered her first child, and that's my first uh, granddaughter. And she was, she had to be uh, a little bit hurt that grandparents were not spending quite as much time with their first grandchild because Evan really was still in the throes of his addiction and his initial re recovery. But she was able to share her experience and, and also even the birth of her daughter to make it part of actually, I, I think, my son's recovery. And that was really, really remarkable. That That's something that I still vividly recall uh, when uh, uh, my son was in a, a rehab facility and he met his uh, niece uh, for the first time, who was just a couple of weeks old. And that sort of typified the, the remarkable ability of this family structure to absorb grief, absorb pain, and still respond in a, in a very, very loving way. And I think that that was a major milestone in, in my son's uh, recovery. Uh, meeting his niece, uh, and having that experience, seeing his sister there who had just uh, been discharged from the hospital the day before, and that I think was a, a milestone or maybe a, a, a turning point. And, and that's not how all families react, but that's sort of how our unit reacted. And that was unbelievably helpful to everybody. Mm -hmm. Real, real turnaround moment. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you have your own practice, your own business, have been in business for a while. So, you know, leadership skills, you understand what it's like to lead people. Um, you know, you have a, 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 a very robust stature 
and credibility in the state of Massachusetts because of the work that you have done uh, in regards to that. Um, and obviously from a leadership, from a family standpoint, kind of guiding everyone through this, just you personally in going through all of this and, and trying to keep the family knit together, um, you know, service the needs of your son, but also be recognition that your wife has needs, your two daughters have needs, your granddaughter has needs, you know, as the individual kind of responsible for leading, you know, paternalistic kind of the, the entire family, how did, how did that impact you? I, I know it has informed your opinion on opioid epidemic, and that's why you were such an outspoken, uh, I won't say critic, but an outspoken advocate for the appropriate treatment. So from you personally as the dad, the husband of all this stuff that's going on, the grandfather, um, how did your leadership skills, the experience that you've had leading a business, you know, a leading uh, your peers in Massachusetts, how did that all prepare you kind of to some degree to lead your family through this process? Wow, that's that's a that's a that's a that's a hard question, Mark. Uh, I, I think. Uh, with all due respect to you, my friend, I, I think that that assumes uh, uh, that uh, you can ever be prepared uh, for something like this, that your experience, or in, in my instance, my uh, my legal experience, or my, my pre-existing and rather substantial knowledge about uh, opioids and the dangers and, and possible misuse of opioids, even as prescription uh, meds, let alone as a, a recreational drug, N nothing, nothing can prepare you for a, a child who uh, is an addict. Uh, it, it is a uh, thunderstorm, uh, a tornado, a tsunami, uh, all, all, all rolled into one. You, you, you are just so shocked and disheartened and uncertain as to what the future will be. I, I, I don't think I was, uh, nor could anybody be prepared for uh, what it uh, feels like to have your child be an addict and actually uh, potentially be just really just uh, that close on a day-to-day -day basis from uh, life or death, depending on uh, what they're using or how much they're using or what their reaction might be to their uh, drug of choice. So I, 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 don't, I don't think I had any uh, ability to uh, lead. I'm, I'm just lucky I was uh, able to uh, follow the process. Um, I uh, have become a, a big a proponent of uh, AA, uh, which uh, teaches humility, 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 rather than uh, 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 leadership. Uh, um, I, 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 don't, I don't feel like I, I, I've learned a lot. I, I value a lot. Uh, Family means uh, more to me, but I don't think that any uh, experience I had either as a business person or uh, as an active civic member of my community or as a lawyer was of uh, uh, any assistance at all. Uh, one thing you hear from a lot of parents that I did find uh, very helpful, and, and I think most parents would agree because it's hard to accept some of these concepts, but it, 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 it was easier for me to follow the journey if, if I acknowledged. Uh, I, I think that uh, in recovery, parents call it the three C's. You know, I didn't cause this. I can't cure it. I can't control it. That, that's that's a that's a very simple set of uh, principles, but they're actually pretty profound because I think it has to be an acknowledgement of the humility that these things happen to anybody at, at, at any time. And really all you can do is provide unconditional love and, and support to your to your addicted child and uh, also just try not to be an enabler. <laughs> gotcha. Well, a, as we finish up, I think, you know, those three C's are really important uh, to, to understand for sure. Um, for someone watching this who may be in the early stages of trying to figure out um, is their son or their daughter, their friend, their spouse, their bot, you know, whatever the relationship might be that they've got some issues. Um, even further down where you've got to make that decision about the intervention to the point of supporting through the recovery process, 
Um, what are some words of wisdom that you could lead someone, not the one who's using, but the ones who are supporting, who are loving, who are trying to help the person who's using? What's some words of wisdom that you could put out there in addition to what you've already shared, which is really, really great info, I think, and, and gives great insight into what that pathway is. What are some things that you would want them to know in addition um, as they're trying to be that caregiver and help that person make it to the other side in active, uh, solid recovery for the rest of their life? Well, it's a little bit counterintuitive, I think, Mark. Uh, parents uh, always uh, want to help their children and of course we sometimes have to fight the tendency that uh, uh, there's a difference on a very simple uh, plane there's a difference between helping your child do his or her homework and then actually parents getting in there and actually uh, doing the homework uh, there, there is there is no there is no way for uh, parents uh, to do the work uh, for the addict. The work has to be done by the addict. The addict has to acknowledge his weakness, has to acknowledge from an AA perspective his powerlessness uh, over the addiction and his need for the group to uh, uh, be of assistance. So I think that as much as parents want to help, I think that they have to acknowledge the three C's and just provide love unconditional love that's the only constant that i think will help a child identify the problem make a commitment to change to change and then to stay changed those are those are really the the uh, steps that are involved and the work the commitment and sometimes the frustration has to all be done by the child not not by the parent and that can be hard and that can be painful uh there's a group i'm a member of in massachusetts called learn to cope and uh, they're sort of uh, famous for on a simplistic level the love that you have to provide sometimes is a little bit sometimes characterized as tough love because you you have to be very careful in terms of any assistance you provide that you're not promoting the addiction. The only thing you want to promote is sobriety. And that's the truth, I think, of, of recovery, at least my, my experience. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much, Ed, for sharing this information. Um, I think there's, uh, for people who are in the midst of this, uh, are just beginning their journey or uh, are in that lifelong journey of recovery. Great wisdom and great insights um, from your journey. I really appreciate you sharing it. Um, and I look forward to people watching this and watching it and watching it and watching it um, and understanding some of the things that they can take from this, from your journey. I, uh, I'm so happy for you, um, for your wife, for your two daughters, for Evan. Um, and for not only the, uh, you know, the unfortunate journey that you had to go through, but what you're in right now, which is the, the um, end result of that metamorphosis, which is a stronger, tighter family um, that is filled with humility, um, understands um, their role, um, and is highly supportive of one another. I, I think it's a great model, and I congratulate you on this on this process um, and just wish you all uh, the best luck um, going forward and continuing to tell this tell this story and um, continue to help Evan become all that he can possibly be with his new trajectory. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mark.